Hello, and welcome to the latest in our series of Abrams Institute Conversations. Today's discussion will focus on the net choice cases the Supreme Court heard last week. These conversations are a program of the Abrams Institute for Freedom of Expression, which is part of the Information Society Project at Yale Law School. We'd like to thank the generous support of the Stanton Foundation, which makes these conversations possible. I'm Tobin Raju, a fellow at the Media Freedom and Information Access Clinic at Yale Law School, and I have the great pleasure of introducing Floyd Abrams, who will be hosting today's conversation. Now, Floyd needs no interrupt introduction, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, Floyd is senior counsel at Cahill, Gordon, and Riddell, and has taught courses in First Amendment law at Yale Law School, Columbia Law School, and the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. He is the author of three books on the First Amendment, the most recent being The Soul of the First Amendment. Floyd has litigated numerous First Amendment cases and has frequently argued cases in the Supreme Court, including Smith v. Daily Mail, Landmark Communications v. Virginia, and Citizens United. There'll be time for questions from the audience after the moderated portion of, this, of the discussion, so please submit any questions you have via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and I'll pass them along to our panel. So with that, I'll hand it over to Floyd. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you to our two panelists for uh, being here. Uh, I don't exaggerate when I say that uh, in the field of law, neither one needs much by way of introduction. I will simply say of, of Tim, that he's the Julius Silver Professor of Law and Technology at Columbia Law School, probably the best known and uh, feted scholar about technology and the law, often characterized as the chief architect of the Biden administration's policies on antitrust uh, and competition, and the author of a moment uh, numerous other books, The Curse of Bigness, Antitrust in the New uh, Gilded Age. I'll also say by way of introduction, the last time I saw Tim was the last class that Vince Blasey and I taught at Columbia Law School. Vince has uh, retired from the faculty there, and uh, I remain most appreciative to you for coming and being with us in celebration uh, of Professor Blasey. Uh, Jack Baldwin is the Knight Professor of Constitutional Law at Yale Law School, the founder of Yale's Information Society Policy Project. He directs the uh, program on freedom of expression at Yale Law School the author of many books on constitutional and First Amendment law, uh, also one of the best titles, if you'll forgive me, Jack, that I've ever heard read of a scholarly book, Constitutional Redemption, Political Faith in an Unjust World. Congratulations uh, for the book, too. Uh, we're here today to uh, talk about, on one level, an argument that occurred in the Supreme Court a week ago Thursday, but more broadly, the sort of issues discussed uh, uh, in the argument. Uh, for those of you who haven't followed this closely, uh, both Florida and Texas have adopted legislation aimed at what their legislators perceived as unfairness and maybe political bias in what has been curated and or sometimes omitted from a broadcast uh, on cable. Uh, uh, and the uh, statutes involved are quite similar, but both based on the same proposition that it is unjust and unfair and limiting to the audience for the proprietors of the entities that own uh, these uh, massive uh, entities for them to engage in what the statutory drafters called censorship, uh, not carrying certain material 
that uh, is submitted for showing to the public uh, on the ground that uh, it's misleading or dangerous or offensive. Um, uh, that that subject uh, arose, I, I think, in its most acute form. And one of the questions posed in the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in the oral argument about the constitutionality uh, of, of this statute, in, the, in this case, a Texas one, which was, quote, uh, are you saying this is to the lawyer for alleging it was on the free speech side, they both do in these cases, but the, the lawyer for the, the owners, the proprietors, right? are you saying that you could have only Democrats on or only people on who favored Democrats? To which the answer was yes. And then an argument about why the First Amendment uh, protected that. Uh, both sides in a case of this sort claim that they are vindicating First Amendment principles. And I'm sure we'll hear about that uh, from our uh, distinguished uh, speakers today. So let me start with, with Tim, who has told us that he has a, a school obligation for his children. So he'll be leaving just a bit early. Well, let me start with you, Tim, and just ask you, what, well, what is your overview uh, of these cases uh, argued uh, just a week or so ago uh, in the Supreme Court? Not so much, although I'd be glad to hear how you think it went, but, but in, in terms of the merits of the case, how do you analyze it? Sure. Thank you, Floyd. Thanks for having me here. And uh, hello to everyone. Jack, it's good to see you again. Uh, I want to sort of say three things by, by way of introduction uh, that interest me uh, about this uh, case. Uh, obviously, there's a lot that, to talk about it. It's kind of a, I'll just say maybe four things. I want to say it is, uh, I went to the oral argument and you know, it was like four hours of almost every issue I've ever thought about in this area, uh, you know, a mixture of First Amendment and uh, parts of telecommunications law and Section 230 and all kinds of everything. So there's a huge number of questions. So the three things first, in the biggest picture to me, uh, this case raises questions about the degree uh, to which the First Amendment is, is conveying a very broad immunity uh, to companies that have speech as part of their business model um, or information as part of their business model. Uh, maybe that's a better way of putting it. Um, uh, you know, I think I'm, I'm not the only person, uh, but I have been concerned over the last uh, uh, say two decades of the rise of uh, the First Amendment um, to uh, become something of uh, an immunity, uh, one that is similar to 30, even even beyond uh, 230, for businesses whose um, business model involves information one way or another. And obviously that's big tab platforms uh, and to some degree, uh, all the other apps. And I think the toughest uh, big picture questions for me raised by this case is you know if you win on a facial challenge doctrine and have a strong First Amendment protection uh, for the big tech companies, does that go too far in creating uh, an immunity or a, uh, a form, I guess some people have said a sort of new uh, form of Lochnerism that makes it difficult to regulate tech platforms in other areas you might want to like privacy, um, even regulation of AI and human impersonation. And I, you know, I don't think that's entirely hypothetical um, uh, last year in the fall, uh, the um, California District Court using the First Amendment struck down a, a children's uh, anti-profiling law, uh, suggesting that the collection of, of data is a form of speech. So that, that, those are the biggest set of issues. The second um, sort of slightly closer issues raised by the case that interest me are at the intersection of um, common carriage doctrine or the old uh, telecommunications uh, doctrines that mandate carriage or mandate uh, fair treatment of um, uh, different uh, customers or clients um, and the First Amendment. It, it seems to me that's a very under uh, explored, under uh, litigated area. I think it's sort of widely taken that um, we can talk about the doctrine if we want to, that uh, since 1910 or so, uh, the government has had the right to 
uh, regulate carriers of information and, and other common carriers um, along certain lines. Uh, uh, the Telecommunications Act of 1936 prohibits uh, discrimination um, as between the customers by a telephone company. So this kind of underexplored area, which ended up coming up in the case quite a bit, as to what degree the um, uh, to what degree the, the states could rely on the sense that they are policing discrimination. Um, now here among viewpoints, not necessarily among customers, but they can act in whether, uh, to what degree you can act in the spirit of, um, uh, of common carriage or anti-discrimination also seen in public accommodations law and say, we want you to treat everybody the same um, and not engage as, as Texas put it in censorship. Florida has a certain way of slightly different way of doing it. And that leads me to my third point. One of the um, uh, third things, the most close to the, the oral argument in case law that interests me about this case is the ongoing challenges around the facial challenge doctrine and the first amendment. So um, I think many of our listeners or viewers will be aware roughly of the first of the facial challenge doctrine, which is uh, different than an as applied challenge. You're saying the law in many of its, uh, in first amendment is not necessarily in all of its applications, that, that's the standard outside the first amendment, but at least in some, uh, the, in many applications uh, is uh, unconstitutional. What exactly you have to prove is I think a little unclear. And one of the things that I, I think an oral argument came across that I wanna emphasize is this case, um, you know, the way it was decided, uh, these cases, I should say, are very uh, nearly devoid of factual development. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of the oral argument was sort of imagining different parts of the internet and how they are. And I think that has made it hard to say what the justices are going to do. It's been a fact since the early days of internet jurisprudence that it's difficult to talk about things at the level of the entire internet, because obviously the internet can be many things. The internet can impersonate a telephone, the internet uh, can be like television. The internet um, can be like mail. And all of those things are very different uh, attributes. Social media um, you know, is, is its own sort of set, sometimes coming right at you, sometimes something you go to. So all these um, uh, classic First Amendment analysis, with, which depend on the degree to which you go out and get things, or things come to you, or what they're like, or what their attributes and how broadcast they are, I mean, the internet imitates every single possible medium before that, before it. And so I think one of the greatest challenges for the case, and if there is a, um, uh, if there's an affirmance or if this doesn't come out in favor of uh, the tech platforms, I think it'll be for lack of uh, factual development for just the sense that, you know, as a facial challenge doctrine, this is too much at once. There are maybe parts of, especially the Florida law that look like a common carriage principle. Um, and you know, deciding something about Gmail at the same time, deciding Google, you know, how things look for Uber, and deciding how things look uh, for Facebook all at once is a crazy way to decide a, decision, a case. In that sense, it's possible that the net choice lawyers may have overplayed their hand. With the, I understand, you know, wanting that quickly, but uh, if there's um, a chance, and I wouldn't rate it highly, there's a chance that uh, net choice loses here, the platform loses here. I think it'll be because uh, procedurally the case is just too far wide open. So that's what I have, three sort of big picture, one, uh, two sort of big picture, one uh, small picture uh, comments and back to you, Floyd. Yeah, thanks. I, I wanna hear from Jack, but I just wanna interpose one question. First on your first uh, of the three points, uh, what you referred to as, uh, as the, the rise of the uh, first amendment immunity is it your view that that has gone too far, that, that, that the courts have overstated what, in your view, uh, should be protected under the First Amendment? Yes, it's definitely my view. Um, I think that um, that First Amendment in some hands, um, less Supreme Court, although sometimes Supreme Court as well, has you know, gone away what I would think is core protection of, of speech and uh, started to invade business regulation. And I think sort of clearest example are the invalidation of, of privacy laws um, 
and you know the California court being an example. But I think it offers, you know, uh, we, we, there's already a sense, my view, that the tech platforms um, do not have the kind of, have enormous amount of power, sometimes rivaling government and not an awful lot of um, accountability because obviously they're not elected. And if they can rely on the first Am amendment to uh, preempt or immunize them to most forms of state or federal regulation, that just seems to make the problem worse. And do you see the court moving in that direction if you had to offer a prediction? Um, I think that that's this case. Um, I think the doctrine leads it in that direction, but I think the justices are starting to see um, both left and right that there is a public appetite for um, regulation of, of tech platforms. I don't know if this was the best case to test it, but I imagine eventually there'll be a case surrounding children's privacy or something like that, where you may have um, the justice say, you know, we, we, this has really gone uh, too far. So I think, as I said, I think the jurisprudence the last decade lends in that direction, but I would predict a sea change coming, particularly as the conservatives have become more critical and have been more interested in seeing regulation of, uh, of the tech firms. Well, Jack, tell us where you're coming from on this. Well, both Tim and I uh, uh, did amicus briefs um, uh, in this case. Tim was on uh, the side of, of states and I was on the side of net choice. Um, I, uh, but you'd be surprised how similar our ultimate views are. Let me try to put the problem this way. Um, one, uh, many reformers have wanted to uh, pass consumer protection law, competition law, uh, public utility law with respect to these large platforms. And, uh, the, and when Texas and Florida passed these laws, there was a hope among many reformers that this would be the opening wedge uh, for uh, certain kinds of legislation that could pass, protect public health, uh, protect consumers, uh, and, uh, and also reduce the uh, competitive power of these large platforms. The problem is these are not the these are not the um, the right statutes, uh, as as Tim adverted to. Um, and and what the 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 posture of the case does is kind of smush together a bunch of different questions. One, uh, so let me give you an example. In the Texas and Florida statutes, we have what purport to be general non discrimination provisions, no discrimination on the basis of viewpoint. In the Texas statute, a requirement that all content moderation be done consistently in the Florida statute. But then when you look at the statutes more carefully, what you discover is that they have all sorts of carve outs and special rules based upon the identity of the speaker and based upon the subject matter. And in some cases, based upon the viewpoint of, uh, of content that appears on the, the internet. And so these aren't, in fact, sort of standard issue uh, competition law statutes. They're not common carriage statutes. They're not really statutes uh, about um, uh, protecting people from the misuse of data collected about them. They're just basically statutes where the, the legislatures got angry about the fact that they feared that liberal uh, folks in San Francisco in the Bay Area were being unfair to conservative voices on things ranging from uh, COVID to, uh, you know, uh, politics and political correctness. So these are just badly fit for the goals of most reformers. And the, and the things that I just identified in the statutes make them subject to strict scrutiny under uh, existing First Amendment law. This is a content-based regulation. It's a speaker-based regulation. And you litigated... Uh, um, uh, Citizens United, and you know that once you make speaker-based uh, distinction, uh, you're in strict scrutiny land in most cases. So that's the problem. And, and so it would be pretty easy to get rid of these cases just on that basic principle, that if you have a statute that makes content-based or speaker-based distinctions, that that's not okay. There are a couple of problems. One problem is that, as Tim adverted to, these cases come on a facial challenge and in the First Amendment, if a statute has a, a broad sweep of legitimate applications, generally courts don't want to use the, the facial doctrine. 
Uh, they prefer an as applied challenge. I think you can get around it. We can talk about that later. But basically, that was the problem that absorbed several, almost an hour of the discussion, actually. Um, the second thing is that there's a there's a there's two different issues at the heart of First Amendment law that are being run together. One is whether or not you can make distinctions based upon content, subject matter, viewpoint, et cetera. And the other is whether or not when the platforms do what they do, that is in content moderation, and when they apply their various algorithms, what they're doing is protected under a different doctrine. And that's the doctrine of editorial judgment uh, in the Miami Herald versus Tornillo case. Now, these things get run together because they're both about content, you see. But in fact, in the context of the social media, one could well say that the rule against content-based regulation or speaker-based regulation still holds, but there is a different question to be answered about the fate of Tornillo with respect to these large platforms. Now, we wrote our brief specifically not to say anything about the Tornillo issue, but that, in fact, was the central argument uh, that Paul Clement made on behalf of NetChoice. He argued that this is fundamentally the same as choices that are made by newspapers in deciding what goes on page one in what and in local broad uh, news uh, television stations on you know what's the first story uh, that that will lead the broadcast. And his view was this is basically the same kind of thing. And therefore, simply on the basis of the Tornillo holding, right? Because Tornillo applies where you don't have scrutiny. I mean, sorry, we don't have scarcity in the model of Red Lion. Um, this violates First Amendment. So both of these different strains of First Amendment law were at stake. I think that the case could easily be disposed of in the first one, content-based, speaker-based, viewpoint-based. Uh, but the whole argument was about the other strain, which is the Tornillo issue. It might one of the problems be that the framers of the statute really did mean and maybe only meant that what they were dealing with was what they viewed as political bias. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, I, I mean, it, it, you're not saying that it was a, a reach for Tornello to be relied upon by by the, uh, broad, by, I, I keep thinking of broadcasters. By, uh, the, by the networks, yeah, yeah. Well, reach is the wrong word. The, the question is, we're at a fork in the road. It It is entirely, this is why Paul Clement made the argument. He said, you know, it's pretty easy to apply Tornillo to this because think about, not, not Facebook, but think about NYT.com. NYT.com, which is the online version of the New York Times, uses algorithms uh, uh, to decide, you know, where things are placed on the web page. They, uh, they automate many different features of their... Uh, of their operations, surely no one would say that NewYorkTimes.com uh, is unprotected under the Tornillo, Tornillo Doctrine. So in other words, this, and by the way, the, the whole discussion about Section 230 by Justice Gorsuch blinked the fact that Section 230 does not just protect large uh, platforms, it also protects NYT.com, it protects my blog, it protects almost everyone who does anything on the internet. So the, the problem was that it, it would seem very natural to use to invoke Tornillo. But the question we have to decide for ourselves is, if you think there's any degree of legitimate public interest in the regulation of the large platforms and the way in which they use artificial intelligence and algorithms to decide what is amplified or deamplified, what goes out more or less, um, then in fact, you may have to take a fork in the road and say, well, Tornillo applies to these media, but it doesn't apply to those media. But that question wasn't placed in front of the court. And the court is not going to decide that question. Or if they decide it, they'll probably take the easy way out and just basically say, looks like newspapers to us. Sam, well, what do you Thank think you about the, yeah, the application of Tornillo to the to this case? Yeah, I, that's that, thank you for uh, giving me this, this opportunity. First, I want to say that there's been some sort of flip, at least uh, uh, as far as I can tell, where we're in an era where conservatives are suddenly interested in the fairness doctrine. Um, I had sort of had the long, long been the opposite. But, you know, these these laws and I maybe I should I said this in our amicus that uh, myself and uh, the co-authors are not particularly fond of these laws. And as, as Jack averted to, that's what creates such a challenging situation is where 
uh, on, on one of the message boards, someone said, uh, you know, it's sort of an impossible uh, situation. But on Tornillo, I wanted to um, say, uh, uh, this is part of the problem with the way this case was litigated, which I agree there's parts of the internet that look an awful lot like a newspaper and parts of social media. Um, uh, you know, the New York Times website, I don't think anyone would say that that uh, feels much different. Uh, but the laws are a very broad application. And I think that's um, what makes discussing them in one uh, kind of, you know, saying the internet is one way or another makes it very hard. Uh, something that came up at oral argument and something where I think Paul Clement wandered into trouble was when people started talking about email. And, um, and you know, uh, do, do you feel the same way about email and um, the actions of, of a, uh, a, do you think the same way about email as you might think about, on, does that feel like an online newspaper to you? Uh, or does it feel more like the post office or something like that? And, you know, there was specifically a question, well, how, you know, uh, the states have any power to, you know, regulate an email provider who decides to downgrade emails from liberal or conservative sources. No, no power, said Clement, rough, I'm paraphrasing. He said that's still first protected, you know, editorial discretion if they want to, you know, run a biased uh, email service in some way, uh, like the Telegraph uh, company, which used to, you know, treat uh, uh, treat uh, uh, telegraphs from different parties differently. Um, so I, I think when you start to, I guess that is one problem with the facial challenge doctrine is you might think it would be reasonable if, if you had a narrow law that applied to email providers and asked them to behave more like FedEx or the post office. I think that might survive First Amendment scrutiny. Same law applied to the New York Times, website seems crazy. Um, social media, which is more at the core of the Texas case, is sort of in between. Um, you know, a newspaper um, is, is different in some ways than, um, let's say, Snapchat or um, Instagram. Um, the newspaper is very carefully curated. Um, you know, it's a big deal as to what gets in or out of, of the traditional print newspaper. And um, there's no promise in the idea of a newspaper that everyone gets to be there. Well, you know, a site like Facebook or Instagram, it's sort of like everyone gets to reach the world. It has sort of more of this common carrier like feature where you sign up and you get to talk to everybody, whether they want to hear you or not is a different story. Um, and so I think that it's not just an obvious application of too little to me to even definitely not to email and probably not to the social media either in the sense that, um, you know, the volume and the promise, what you're held out as, which is very important, it is quite different. Um, so I'll, maybe I'll leave it there, at the risk of wandering on too long, Tornillo. But um, yeah, I, I uh, you know, Cruniard was brought up by by the other side. Uh, you know, I think there's it's a perfect analogy. Our brief did say this is controlled by Pruniard. So I'd throw that into the story as well, which was, of course, the case where uh, the mall was uh, required to carry all kinds of speakers. And there must be some room for something uh, here, um, you know, and how many of those applications are, are constitutional. I think we're not, we don't know from this particular litigation. Jack, what do you think of the some room for something uh, notion? Well, uh, so add it, it uh, phrase perfectly. I'm gonna I'm gonna carry on with the thing that, that Tim started and just point make two points. First of all, our First Amendment doctrines are not actually well organized to deal with these different kinds of of uh, applications. One example is email, which came up as Tim said in the oral argument. The problem is that. A non, a, 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 an order to email uh, servers that they couldn't distinguish on the basis of content um, would uh, be bad for everyone because most of the justices don't realize it, but the first thing that email providers do is have spam filters. Uh, and those distinguish on the basis of content. Um, moreover, uh, Gmail now has different tabs uh, for social, promotional, and other things. Uh, that basically organize your email into different parts. And you could certainly imagine an email provider deciding that it wanted to offer all sorts of ways of basically configuring uh, the kind of email that you receive, uh, which would be speaker-based or content-based. Uh, nevertheless, what email does is, is fundamentally different than what a lot of other applications do. And so the rules for email would strike me as different than the rules that might apply to other applications. But the First Amendment doctrines of content-based, uh, speaker-based, 
these things just basically cover everything. They don't make any distinction between these different kinds of services. The second thing has to do with the problem of social media companies. You could argue, as Eugene Volokh actually has argued in print, that maybe uh, that social media companies have a duty to carry uh, things that are uploaded to their servers. But carriage doesn't guarantee that anyone will see it. And the thing that the uh, Texas and Florida were really upset about was a practice they called shadow banning. Uh, shadow banning is not a thing. Shadow banning is an is an epithet directed toward the um, uh, uh, toward some combination of the content moderation system and the recommendation system. That is to say, what gets put uh, before people as recommended to, for them to see. And the problem is that it's very hard to imagine a recommendation system that doesn't run afoul of uh, uh, a, a regulation. Uh, recommendation systems make distinctions. They make distinctions based on speakers. They make distinctions based on on at least reactions by audiences, and they make distinctions to some degree, it depends on the recommendation system in terms of the content of what's being provided. You can create a recommendation system that knows nothing about the content, but only relies on speaker reactions. But still under First Amendment doctrine, making uh, something turn on speaker reactions is content-based or viewpoint-based. So the problem is that, again, the, the way in which these particular things work is not well crafted to draw lines that the First Amendment recognizes, which is why, in my view, and actually this will be, I'll throw this back to Tim in a second, the correct solution, it seems to me, has got to lie in a combination of consumer protection models and competition models. That is consumer protection aimed at the collection and use of data and competition in terms of breaking up the uh, monopoly power of these particular groups there are a lot of ways to do it. One way outside of antitrust is just simply to allow uh, interoperability, which would allow lots of different players in the market uh, and, and create different um, kinds of markets for different aspects of what social media companies now do all together. So those are competition law remedies. There are also consumer remedies that are based on privacy. And these would go a long way, I think, toward dealing with the, the, the um, unaccountable, unaccountable power of the largest companies and also their, their sort of cornering the market, their monopoly power as well. What, the, what they wouldn't do is they wouldn't regulate directly the choices the companies make about uh, content moderation or about recommendation systems. So in other words, these kinds of reforms, which were not on the table in this case, but I am concerned might be taken off the table by the way the court writes the opinion, it seems to me that these are the correct way to go in reform. Very interesting to you. Do you, uh, do you think that the petitioners in the case for plaintiffs would have done better if they had sought narrower relief? I mean, if, if they had cabined it more clearly so it fit within the Tornillo-like uh, 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 protections of the First Amendment. I mean, of course, they they could walk away with a complete victory. But but I, what, what I'm asking is if you think as a strategic matter, uh, they well, you know, if you asked me what I would to, and count, got to, and, right. sorry, what I would Go pound on. the table on, if I were on uh, Paul Clement's side, he didn't, you know, he he was very good. I mean, the yeah. guy is a professional; he knows what he's yeah. doing. But if, if he were to ask me for advice, I would have said, you should pound the table on the vagueness of the statutes because of the way in which they don't seem to understand how recommendation systems work. To give you just one example, one simple example that didn't come up. There's a requirement that you have to give an explanation uh, when you take an adverse uh, uh, action with respect to an end user. But the adverse actions include not only uh, 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 knocking someone off this, the system, or taking down their posts, but also when you take any uh, uh, decision about recommendations in al your algorithms that could affect uh, the reception of the content. And the problem is everyone is affected by the recommendation system. So, and the recommendation algorithms are constantly changing. They're engaged in machine learning. So what would happen is that you constantly have to explain to everyone all the time 
why the system was working the way it was. And that's ridiculous. That, that can't be a plausible claim. But the problem is the way the statute is written, ordinary people, to use the famous test, have to guess at how the statute will be applied. So there's a very strong argument that the statute is unconstitutionally vague. And you well remember, Floyd, that in the Reno case decided in 97, the court didn't go off on overbreadth, it went off on vagueness. And so I would have made a much bigger deal about how vague certain features of the statute are, statutes are. Uh, uh, Tim? Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's interesting. I, 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 in the lab. We, yeah, please. No, I was struck um, by the uh, aggressiveness, uh, far-reachingness of um, Net Choices arguments. Um, you know, whether these were Paul Clement's choices or Net Choices, I'm not sure. And I think it was an overreach myself. You know, at oral argument, at least in the, in the Moody, in the first uh, the Florida case, I counted four and a half um, votes for a remand. I wasn't totally sure where Barrett, but it, it, uh, Justice Jackson was kept saying, we don't have enough facts here, what's going on? Obviously, at Thomas, um, Gorsuch seemed very obsessed with 230. You know, they definitely went for it. And I had a little sense that maybe they had been, you know, uh, drinking a little too much of their own Kool-Aid or, or just gotten completely convinced. So obviously, this statute was so outrageously unconstitutional that there was no way um, they should try something more cautious, like go for an as-applied challenge or go uh, with vagueness, which, as Jack said, uh, was mm -hmm. successful in Reno, but go for the, the big win. Now, you know, if, if they get it, um, I think that that works for them. I mean, they are, as I've said, difficult uh, statutes. Um, but, uh, I, yeah, I thought they, uh, and I, I think that during oral argument, particularly in the email part, you know, everyone has a moment where they get into trouble. And uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but it seemed to me that when, um, you know, Paul Clement was talking about email, and I think a lot of people think of email like mail, um, kind of a fact of life, like the tell you know, so this infrastructure you rely on. And when he started insisting it that the, you know, effectively the post office of our time have the right to, um, you know, block information from anyone they feel like whenever they want as a discretion of editorial judgment and the First Amendment right, I, I think uh, there's a lot of discomfort on the bench. Um, another reaction I'd have, you know, I agree with, uh, we were talking about email, I agree with Jack, it would be um, uh, probably bad policy uh, to get heavily involved in a sort of fairness doctrine for email because of, because of spam. But there's, you know, always got to be a line between what's bad policy and what's unconstitutional. And I can't imagine that email has the full I don't think Jack is saying this, but the argument which Clement came close to making that email has the, and, and mail systems have the full kind of First Amendment protection that a, a newspaper does or a pamphlet just doesn't seem consistent with US history um, framers intent or uh, frankly, the, the practice of the common carriage laws or the post office or of um, uh, telephone networks. So. Yeah, I think they, they took some real risks in this. And if they get a remand in Moody, I think that will be uh, the reason. Just to offer a, a litigator, a personal litigator reaction, I, I want to come back to the vagueness in particular, but vagueness and related uh, uh, doctrines. It seems to me that, if, I mean, if I were representing uh, the the internet entities, I would have said we can do better than winning on vagueness. That that if if we win on vagueness, they'll be back again. They'll write it better. Uh, now I'm, I'm not saying that's the way our society ought to work, but I'm just saying from a pure litigation standpoint, it it would it, I think this is sort of hard to resist going going for it all. Uh, now, of course, we saw what happened when they went for it all, and then, then there were problems, harder problems than Tornillo was faced with about exactly what was before the court and what did he want and what was the record and, you know, and things like that. Uh, so uh, it, it's not, not easy. Uh, yeah, do you two think that the Fairness doctrine would be upheld as constitutional by this court. 
You mean the fairness doctrine as to radio and television? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I think that there probably are five votes to strike it down. I mean, if Red Line came up today, I think the court would say that the scarcity yeah. the scarcity basis on which the doctrine rested is is spurious and and they would probably not uphold it, uh, which is very ironic since uh, uh, with respect to the internet, as Tim said, well, uh, um, yeah, that... an attraction to it. Tim, well, what, do, what do you think about a constitutionality, this court of a fairness doctrine, so to speak, for not broadcast anymore, but for the internet? I mean, I think that's this case. Um, and I think if you call it the fairness doctrine, I think it would be struck down. But <laughs> because, you know, conservatives know that they're against fairness doctrine and some and First Amendment liberals know that, too. And it's based on this week. But if you call it, um, you know, uh, well, as the Texas law does, um, you know, an anti-conservative law, I think the split becomes more challenging. I, I don't I feel like a lot of conservatives are a little uncomfortable, but they don't like to think about the fact that the Texas law is not unlike a fairness doctrine. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. I don't know. Um, that's where I'd put it. Looking at the court. I should just say, though, that like, this was not, this was not, you know this better than I, this is not the fairness doctrine that applied during the middle of the 20th century because the fairness doctrine didn't say you couldn't make distinctions based on viewpoint. And it didn't say that you had to apply your content editorial judgments, uh, you know, consistently. All it said was that you had to cover public issues sometime, probably early on Sunday morning. And when you did, you had to offer, quote, both sides. Right. And you got to define what the both sides were. Um, yes, but it did, I, say, it, it did that, that is true. But it did say the way you covered it had to be fair. You know, I, it, which was I, left to the editorial the, I discretion. Doctrine. I know, um, but it was left to the editorial discretion of the broadcaster. That's what's so funny is that it, yeah. that that it's it's exactly first of all it's it's inappropriate for this uh, for this particular medium. But even in its own heyday, it was it was largely toothless. It actually only had one significant consequence. I don't know. I'd be interested in your view on this, Floyd. It made talk radio of the form we have it today very difficult to achieve. That was the one thing the fairness doctrine did. I don't know because I think I, oh, political sorry, go ahead. too. It was used in smaller markets, in particular, as mm -hmm. as a way to suppress speech because it was a pain to get someone on the other side right. all the time. I mean, I remember as an associate a hundred years ago representing NBC when the Alaska pipeline was was much discussed and debated. And they had someone on, a former secretary of something, who opposed the pipeline. And so I know they spent the whole morning, because I was involved with it, trying to find someone who liked the pipeline. And then we got someone, and you don't want to ask someone, are you sure you're going to say you like it? And he was nuanced. And so we had to get another person to be more strongly on that side. Uh, that, that at least was one of the on the ground impact uh, of, of, of the fairness doctrine. What? Well, I mean, I distinguish so, between the, if, if you don't mind, I, I would distinguish please. slightly, and uh, I wasn't, I don't have a lot of firsthand experience with the fairness doctrine, but I have read a certain amount of media history. And I feel there's a distinction between the sort of literal legal effects of the fairness doctrine and the overall kind of how should you conduct yourself sort of Walter Cronkite CBS News kind of effects. And I think, uh, you know, you had uh, a sense of the FCC, sort of Newt Minow era, um, essentially nagging broadcasters or being on them to be these sort of more uh, neutral purveyors of information. Um, and I know Fox News is a is a cable channel, but the idea of running a, you know, broadcast version of Fox News or the equivalent MSNBC, I, I don't think would have been, you know, a, would have been a non-starter in the 50s and 60s. So, I, you know, the sort of vaguer effects, I think, are, are also pretty important. You know, because you have to leave a, a, a bit early today, and I don't know the answer to the question I'm about to ask, 
But have there been any written questions or the like uh, submitted, which we, we should ask uh, the panelists? We don't have any, but I welcome our no. attendees to submit any if they do. No, okay. Okay, fine. So we, we, we can uh, continue. Suppose the court strikes down the, uh, the these these laws, and suppose Florida, Texas, whatever, really want to have the best shot of of assuring what what they believe is fairness, or at least not have the situation as they perceived it of the other side having. Uh, the the bright lights and all the people on its side all the time. What 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 would be left open? Do you think by a victory for the uh, internet uh, offerers? I mean, what where where then might a state go uh, in in an effort to? I won't even finish the sentence. Uh, but but uh, you know, in, in an effort to assure that all sides are heard, if if anyone, I know we can't predict how the how the court is going to go. I think we're but. pausing because it's a hard question, and obviously depends on how they they strike it down. No. I mean, I, I I think the political appetite um, for these kinds of laws uh, remains uh, strong. Um, I mean, obviously, it depends on why that why they're striking it, why they're striking it down. Um, I think that perhaps there would be a stronger uh, effort. One of the things I noticed um, where I thought Texas and Florida started getting in trouble is uh, this is a little more policy than it is um, uh, than it is constitutional law. But Texas, you know, when they started responding, Texas, what are you going to do about terrorist speech? You know, what are you going to do about the and then. Texas kind of tried to walk about that. And I, I think on a policy level, a lot of the conservatives were like, well, we can't be on the side of something that says the carriers can't, uh, or the platforms can't do anything to take down um, Al Qaeda. So I, I, may, I wonder if they would repass them with more room for um, uh, moderation, you know, more room for their moderation and um, some effort to make it maybe purely political. I, I, I don't know how that would work either. It might run into the same problems, but um, you know, more room for sort of commonplace uh, content moderation to protect children for sort of accepted, broadly accepted goals. Um, I don't know. That also has First Amendment challenges, but I can imagine that policy-wise appealing to more of the conservative justices. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I should I should say this is, you're assuming a particular Florida legislature and a Texas legislature that don't really yeah. exist. Um, yeah. the, these are these are culture war statutes, uh, which are based upon imagined states of the world that may or may not be the case. And so, I'm going to answer the question based on a non-existent legis state legislature. But suppose yeah. a non-existent state legislature was genuinely interested in making it easier for people to get access to controversial information that they felt was not being taken, was not respected sufficiently by the largest players. If that's what they wanted to do, they could require that the application protocol interface or application uh, programming interface for these companies be opened up in such a way uh, that an alternate content moderation system could be attached uh, to the, uh, uh, the, the and uh, there is a problem because that um, this is actually what our brief was about. There are various preemption problems that come with that because there's a federal statute that prevents uh, the, the Consumer Fraud and Abuse Act that might get in the way, uh, but uh, that's what you would do. What you would do is say we have no problem we. We have no problem with you running your own content moderation system, but you shouldn't have a monopoly over the content moderation system. We have no problem with you having your own recommendation system, but you shouldn't have a monopoly on the recommendation system. And indeed, you should open up your 
your the basic structure of your application so that competitors could enter into this market. Uh, I don't, and that would be very, very free market like, and and conservatives often like the free market. Uh, I don't think though it would satisfy uh, the current politics um, that motivated these particular statutes. Jack keeps uh, last, yeah, yeah, go on, Sam. Go ahead. Jack, Jack keeps uh, saying things that I should be saying, <laughs> which is right. I mean, I, I, what I'd like them, what I would like states to do, or frankly, the federal government, is to work at what is obviously the underlying power here, problem here, which is a sense of, of monopoly or excessive power and concentration uh, and lack of consumer protection. You know, that would be the more uh, working from the root cause kind of problem you know, stronger uh, state privacy statutes that uh, protected collection of data as opposed to just um, uh, controlled what entities did with data that they already uh, have collected. So I have, an, I, I agree with Jack, there's a number of things that would in some ways um, hydraulically solve or address these problems. But I also agree that it's sort of unlikely that the, the states are in, at least Texas and Florida are, are, are interested in those kind of statutes. One other idea is kind of off the wall is whether maybe they'll sort of embrace encryption or something in some method, you know, kind of a don't tread on me. I don't know exactly how this would happen, but at least for some things, try to make, uh, um, you know, tr I, I was thinking about this particularly with email, just like try to force the, off the, the uh, offering of encryption uh, based, highly encrypted uh, email solutions or something like that so that the carriers don't themselves even know what people are, are sending to each other. I don't know. That was just something that, that come up. I don't know how that works in social media. I, I, it's a very good, very good point, Tim. And I want to spend just a little time mentioning on it. As yeah. you know, there are messaging services that are encrypted. Some of the messaging services aren't, but some of them are. Um, from the standpoint of one of the problems with the encrypted systems is they, uh, the business models for these have not been entirely worked out because you have to insert advertising in the stream. And if it's really encrypted, it's very hard to do that. Uh, they are working on it, however. And in fact, there is a paper I read recently about how you might even be able to do some uh, forms of content moderation within an encrypted stream. Um, uh, but I don't think that encrypted uh, messaging systems are the panacea to, um, uh, to the problem. And indeed, from the standpoint of what you and I are both concerned about, um, uh, the public health consequences, for example, the encrypted systems make things worse to a certain degree. Uh, and, and certainly, if you're worried about the use of uh, social media to foment uh, violence, uh, ethnic conflict, and in some cases, genocide, uh, encrypted messaging systems don't make things better. In some cases, they make them worse. Um, but yes, I think you know, there, if there was a silver lining to this particular case, it might be that uh, the, the Supreme Court's decision might divert attention to other kinds of reforms that uh, were around questions of privacy, uh, consumer protection, and competition. My concern, and I will repeat again what I said, is I'm worried that if you write this opinion really broadly, you're not mm -hmm. only going to uh, respond to these statutes that Texas and Florida wrote, but you're also going to make it different a difficult for a more, how shall I say, enlightened legislature or Congress in the future to pass these other kinds of public spirited reforms. Let me ask you a final question, Tim. I know you, you have to go. Uh, Section 230, it seemed to me the court was more interested than the lawyers and, and the impact of, say, the potential impact of Section 230 on the case, which uh, I take it is that the internet entities begged Congress and said, we're not, we're, we're not newspapers. You know, we're, we are something else. We're something different. Uh, uh, should Section 230 have, have any impact uh, on the resolution? That's a good question. I think the, uh, as Justice Gorsuch was commenting, I think the way, it, the degree it would, it would be because it's preemptive of uh, either of, and, and maybe they saw this as a way out. Um, you know, there's maybe an old fashioned, but if you can read a statute to avoid a constitutional ruling, that's one way out. And maybe what uh, Gorsuch was trying to say is that maybe these statutes are preempted by Section 230 so we don't have to reach the Constitution. Um, I had some trouble 
seeing exactly why that would happen, given that in, in many uh, areas, it seemed to me that Texas and Florida statutes were addressing the carriers, um, the platforms themselves, and how they acted as opposed to the status of speech being hosted by uh, the platforms, which strikes, which I've always understood to be Section 230's main uh, concern. It, you know, Section 230 in its core um, uh, suggests that the uh, that the uh, host, the, the simple simplified version is a host um, of speech is not publisher of that speech. Um, you know, maybe Jack uh, uh, sees the preemption itself. I could see some ways in which uh, there might be overlap with what they're trying to do. But I had trouble seeing a total preemption of the laws, which maybe was uh, some of the justices were hoping uh, was a way out of this um, this opinion, which I'm sure they're dreading uh, having to try to, to try to write. Um, mm. the, I, the last thing I'll say is I did think that Paul Clement in the oral argument did a terrific job of uh, handling uh, handling some of the question of whether the intent of Section uh, 230 was different. Uh, uh, you know, was was in conflict with uh, the laws here, First Amendment values, because he kept saying, you know, we had Congress here encouraging, um, uh, we had Congress encouraging the major hosts of content, the platforms, uh, to be engaged in Good Samaritan activity and to engage in content moderation. So I thought Clement made a really uh, strong point there that uh, kind of seemed also dead in the enthusiasm for getting very deeply into Section 230 and whether it was meant to preempt it. I mean, if, if Congress was intending and, and wanted to give immunity for platforms engaged in platform moderation, it's hard uh, to see how that would preempt an effort to, uh, to ban content moderation or excessive content moderation by, uh, by viewpoint. Jack, I don't know if you have- I, I thought it would go in the opposite direction. Yeah. If okay. content moderation is what the statute uh, penalizes, so in other words, if, if, if the Florida and Texas statutes uh, penalize content moderation and allow private causes of action for damages, then a federal statute that says you'll be held harmless if you engage in content moderation would seem to preempt the Texas and Florida statutes. What I thought was going on, there were two things I thought were going on with Section 230 in the line of questioning. Mm -hmm. First of all, Gorsuch and Alito were trying to make the argument that the fact that Section 230 says you're not a speaker or publisher means that you shouldn't enjoy any First Amendment rights. And for reasons I described earlier, that's not a very plausible argument because Section 230 also protects NewYorkTimes.com and lots of other folks who nobody doubts have First Amendment rights. Right. The other thing that was going on with the Section 30 discussion was Justice Thomas, who was basically repeating a point that's been made in the conservative legal movement, which is that Section 230C2, which provides the immuni immunity for content moderation does not apply to most of the things that the social media companies moderate for. It only applies to obscene, lewd, yeah, lascivious, right. and otherwise objectionable. And what Thomas was saying is otherwise objectionable has to be very similar to obscene or lewd or lascivious, whereas the general view of courts uh, since uh, Zarin has been that otherwise objectionable is not limited by the terms that come before. Otherwise objectionable means otherwise objectionable. That is objectionable for other reasons. Yeah. And that issue, uh, if the court took it up, would have a revolutionary effect on the way in which the yeah. internet functions. But I don't think there are the votes to adopt uh, Justice Thomas's yeah. concern. But on the first point you made, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to go to this, but um, you know, maybe, there, maybe they could find a way. I mean, I would guess, just in terms of my prediction, I feel like the justices won out of this case. You know, you know, they had to take this conflict, but they want out. They got up there. There's a million things going on. Uh, the challenge is that remanding this all um, for further de facto development, denying preliminary injunction, it is will be taken as a big, huge victory by Florida and Texas. And um, even if you know technically it isn't, the, the headlines will be taken as a huge victory. And I'm not sure how comfortable Supreme Court would would feel with that. And I feel like they're probably, when you look at it, um, you know, I'm not a party, so I'm not bound by this, I'm just an amicus. I think if you look carefully, you will almost certainly find unconstitutionality in there. The question of how much it is, whether it's vagueness, whatever. I mean, these are kind of crazily written laws, you know, somewhere in there, uh, and any as applied challenge is certainly gonna be a loser. So I mean, what I mean is a winner for the, for the plaintiffs. So it'll probably be back there. 
Um, so even if they remand, it'll come back and then it'll be like, you know, turn one, one of these things where you have several in a row. Um, so I think they, they won out. Um, 2.30 doesn't look the most promising, but maybe that also adds to the, we can't decide it now, or this these are largely preempted or go figure that out kind of thing. So uh, I, I think they're probably desperately looking away. So if I had to bet, maybe I think it's a fractured opinion, but they find some way for more fact development, but it's close, it's close. I don't know if Jackie- if you... Last words, if you had to bet, what, what are they gonna do? Is this to me, uh, Lloyd? Yeah, today. Uh, a mm -hmm. narrow, a, a very narrowly written opinion, which uh, is in favor of that choice. Uh, with possibly a remand for further factual development. I don't imagine, I mean, I can always be wrong. I'm very bad at predicting what this court will do, but uh, I don't imagine there'll be a very, very broad opinion. I think it'll be a narrow opinion. Yeah, I think that is, and that's maybe a success of some of the briefing, but a very narrow opinion. I would also say the second, very, very narrow, uphold the preliminary injunction, but make it, try to make it say it's not a big victory. It's just a, you know, while the trial goes on. And kind of opinion and, and narrowly we think there's enough here the preliminary injunction should should be there it's supposed to be I mean, you're only supposed to get preliminary injunctions when you have high success degree in the merits but anyway thank you for having me guys it's been really, I, uh, I said that we let you go yeah thank you both for for coming uh i enjoyed the exchange and i appreciate your being here thanks